this is Soho, just like I pictured it. In fact, this is my street. This is where Broadway. Where you live, yeah. 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 Art galleries, coffee shops, graffiti, bums. Oh look, they've cleaned up all the bums. And we think you left. I moved out. Have it. The neighborhood went up. I used to live on that top floor up there, underneath the water tower. And I caught on the on the door the, the name of my buzzer was Benjamin Franklin. I figured that was a generic American name that would fool people. I spent a lot of time here. It's a very busy, uh, inspiring kind of vibe here, you know. Taxis and tourists and people. I've got Englishman in New York in that apartment. We will be together. Be still my beating heart. You dance alone, fragile. I like to go to places and try and be incognito and just be a fly on the wall and look at human situations without being a celebrity in them. constantly being observed as a celebrity but your job is to observe and you, it's it's nice to be not in disguise like I don't you know don't, don't wear funny hats or anything but just to go places where people don't expect you to be in a bar and just be hanging out and sitting down quietly and you can observe stuff there this is rock line the weekly radio show that gives you the opportunity to interview the biggest names in rock and roll Tonight, Rockline is pleased to welcome one of rock's most visionary artists, Sting. Amber's in Memphis, Tennessee tonight, listening to Rock 103. Hi, Amber. Hello. Hello, Amber. Uh, quick comment. I'd like to wish you a happy belated birthday. Oh, thank you. Um, that I think you're probably the most genius artist I've ever come across. Serious? Uh, yeah. Um, my question to you is, um, as far as your new song goes, When We Dance, um, what inspired you or influenced you, and um, do you have any plans to do a studio album, and when might that come about? Uh, that's a lot of questions. Um, what inspired the, when we dance? I suppose it's uh, I'm quite interested in obsession uh, as a, as a, some, a subject for songs. You know, I've written a few songs that are very obsessive. This is a song that's about a sort of tri a love triangle. You know, where instead of uh, I love you and you love me, it's I love you but you love someone else, and that that kind of interests me. When We Dance was a song that took me a long time to write. There's a kind of sinister, sinister undertone to the song, even though it's kind of seductive and romantic. It's one of those songs that has an undertone of sinis sinisterness. Is that the right word? Sinistry. I like songs that are ambiguous, that have two conflicting emotions going at the same time. I think that's more, that's more three-dimensional than just, you know, I love you and you love me and isn't everything wonderful? I've written songs that took me six or seven months to figure out how to get from one section to another harmonically. Or how to write a second verse that I couldn't write or a bridge I couldn't write. Month, and month after month went by until I finally cracked it like a, like a puzzle. Some songs almost wrote themselves uh, by automatic writing. <laughs> like they were written already and you just somehow channeled them. Um, I think one of my most successful songs was written that way, which is Every Breath You Take was written maybe 10, 15 minutes. So this is, this is CBGB's in the middle of the Bowery. It's the first place I ever played in, in the United States. It's virtually identical to what it was. I mean, it hasn't changed one iota and shouldn't. It's a national monument. During the day, it's, it, it's fine, but at night, Pretty threatening environment. <laughs> Not that I was scared or anything from a rough time myself, but this is pretty wild. Pretty wild. Down there is where I had my first American cup of coffee and my first chef salad. And I couldn't believe how big this salad was. A chef salad. I've never never seen a salad this big in my life. 
and a cup of coffee. And um, then the lady started to refill my coffee cup, and I said, I didn't have any more money for another cup of coffee. She said, oh, it's okay, honey, it's free. I thought, God bless America, this is the place for me, you know. Well, we used to hover between 42nd Street and the Bowery. That was, that was our kind of social milieu. And now I live uptown, because I'm an uptown girl, you know. In fact, I moved into Billy Joel's apartment, there you go. Uptown girl. Today, this evening, Thing is in New York, the new album Fields of Gold, the greatest hits collection. Dale is in Benton, Louisiana, listening to KTAL 98 in Shreveport. Dale? Hi, Dale. Hello, Dale. Uh, my question is, do you think that there will ever be a police reunion after your success as a solo artist? I don't think there's going to be a police reunion, I have, I have to be honest with you. I think my, my motto is you can't step in the same river two times, you know. We, we achieved everything we set out to do and more. So I don't think there's any any need to be, you know, rejoining, except for nostalgia's sake. I'm not that nostalgic. I think we, ca we capture the energy of uh, punk music, or the commitment of punk music. But added to that, there was a, there was a, a sophistication in the way we played, in the way we wrote songs. I think we were older than a lot of punk bands. Uh, we had more musical experience, and so it was a good crossover for, for us. We, we, we had this energy, this great violent energy, plus this sophistication, and I think that's what did it. So this is 44th Street, and behind me is the Iroquois Hotel, which is the first hotel I ever stayed in. It's actually much nicer than it used to be. It looks beautiful now. At the time, it was pretty funky. Apparently, after we stayed there, a lot of people figured it was a cool thing to do, you know? And there's a Royal Inn across the road, which is very trendy now. So the whole street is kind of coming up. I suppose that the first solo album I did, so-called solo album, although I, I did it with other people, <laughs> um, was really about having the freedom to, um, to put any song I liked on the record without going through this committee stage that bands always have to go through, you know, we take a vote on what's good. I've been very lucky in my, my career that I've had some of the best bands available, some of the best musicians, certainly. And I include the police in, in, in that. Um, so when I left the police, I, I really had to have a, a band that was as good. And uh, found a band here in New York. And it was an, an incredible band. Many people from the jazz world, although they could play rock music just as well. Yeah, I'm not a pure... Uh, rock and roll era. Uh, I'm not interested in pure jazz or pure anything, really. Start again, Doc. One, two, three, two. separated off into little ghettos, you know. It's always been my philosophy and I, th I think it's reflected in my music. People would say, oh, you know, I'm just uh, a dilettante, I dabble in this and I dabble in that, I never get into one thing. I don't believe in one thing. I believe in the totality of music, and, and I think pop music is a, is a great mongrel. It's, it's good for you, you steal from all, your, all these sources and use it and, and reconstitute it as something else. Country music is not, not new to me. I mean, I've known country music for years and years and years, you know, a great deal of respect for country music. Um, 
I mean, I, I tend to use it uh, as just another color, you know, something to, it's usually an, amu amu an amusing way. For me. So I wrote the Cowboy song as a sort of sequel to The Magnificent Seven. It's not a terribly serious song. It's funny. So this is a normal breakfast at the uh, Sting House. This is how we have breakfast. We dress up for breakfast. Tomorrow's Cavaliers and Roundheads. We have Stone Age breakfast on Wednesday. Flintstones vibe. <laughs> oh, we're doing a, a show on uh, the Letterman show tonight. We're doing the Cowboy song, so we're just getting into the vibe. You know? Our horses are waiting outside. Two priests came round our house tonight. One young, one old, I'm dressed for the dying to serve the final rite. Until I want to teach Which way the cold wind blows Fussing and flapping like Like a murderer crows All this time The river flows Endlessly I want to maintain some kind of dignity in, in what I do and I don't really want to compromise myself too much in order to do my work. And I think that really is a function of being honest about who you are. I like being who I am at the age I am. I'm 43. I was 43 last month. Uh, I've never had so much fun since I, I turned 40. <laughs> Somehow the, the cliche of life begins at 40 actually is true for me. Um, I'd hate to have to pretend that I was younger or try and... Uh, disguise the fact that I, I'm, you know, a father of f five children or that I've uh, led an interesting life. But spirituality means a lot to me, more and more. I think as I, as I um, face the idea of my own mortality, that, you know, you're not going to be here forever, I think it gets more and more important. And uh, it's kind of an adventure. You could say People look for spirituality in, in many ways. I suppose they look to music because music has a, has a naturally spiritual component. First of all, it's a mystery. What music is, none of us really know. People will look for, for spiritual insight in lyrics or in, in melody, harmony. I, I think an artist should be very serious about that effect that you can have on people. I always thought that risk was uh, an essential element and the artistic life. I think without risk, there's nothing. <laughs> I've, all, I've taken a lot of risks in my, in my life. I think to become a singer was a risk. To, uh, to leave a successful group was a risk. To go off on your own was a risk. Each, uh, each time you write a song, you're, you're putting your innermost feelings into a song and putting it out to the world with the risk of being shot down in flames. Do I have to tell a story of a thousand rainy days since we first met? It's a big enough umbrella. But it's always me that ends up getting wet Every little thing she does is magic Everything she do does turn me on Even though my life before was tragic Now I know my love for her goes on the amount of risk that you've taken, it's, 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 it works out. <laughs> you know? I, I like risk. I enjoy it. So I've no idea what I'm going to do next. I have the foggiest idea. But I suppose it will have to be a risk. Otherwise, it's 
It's mean to me. A studio album, Ben Summon of Tales, you describe it as a pop record in its true sense. Uh, what sort of description would you give it to Mercury Falling? I think it's a pop record too. I, I think it's a very uh, diverse record in, in terms of its references, in terms of its styles. It, it takes, uh, it steals from many sources and I stretch all of those forms into something different. You're playing with uh, Kenny Kirkland and Bramford Marsalis again, like in your first solo album. Is, are you trying to recapture the, the, the spirit of this album? No, well, uh, these people are still very good friends of mine, even though uh, Bramford left, left the band and went on to bigger and better things, he still comes back. And Kenny's now back in the band. It's almost like having a music academy. You know, people uh, leave you and they come back. Nothing Like the Sun succeeds for me as sort of uh, an expansive album that goes everywhere from from joy to the sarcasm of Rocksteady to sort of the, the compassion. Yeah, I run so from you know, sarcasm to compassion. That's, that's my, they're my two uh, poles. <laughs> but is that, I mean, we, is that, to me that says some sort of balance, and I wonder if that was a goal that you had that you went into. I know other people have said that it's not a balanced record at all, but anyway, that's the way I saw it. I don't it. know. I, I think, you know, those, those songs chose themselves from about 20. And um, in the end, I had to look to see if there was anything that connected them, any shape to them. They were just songs I liked. And that's why I wrote these copious liner notes, try and figure out, was there a, a theme running through them, either musically or, or lyrically or whatever. And in, in t taking every song separately and then deciding what it was about, I did recognize a theme and, if you like, a kind of balance. And the theme, I suppose, is um, the female in my own psyche, as opposed to women, the way they're normally, women are normally treated in, in pop music is as um, a fantasy figure, it's not as real women. And the women I was writing about were mothers, uh, sisters, um, wives, mistresses, girlfriend, whatever, but it was, I would hope, real women as opposed to this kind of thing in high heels and uh, skimpy dresses, you know, which I have no objection to at all, you know, I, I think eroticism is, is very powerful, but um, it's not all there is to a woman. I'm sure you'll be pleased to know this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this kind of thinking from a man marks some kind of maturity, I hope. And I think that's what holds the album together. That's what gives it any balance it has, or imbalance. And your own feminine side? My own feminine side, yeah. It's something that I, th I think a lot of men um, are conditioned to suppress, to pretend that we're totally macho, you know. The end result of that is that you get dressed up in sort of combat gear and you have guns and you go shooting innocent animals and it's pretty stupid, really. It's the sort of Rambo ethic. If that's, if that's manhood, I don't want it. Um, I think a man at his finest is probably a man who can look after his kids or cook them a meal, you know. That's, uh, I can do it. <laughs>